Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Simeone Scaramuzino, and I'm the leader of the Milan chapter of Transformative Technology. We are a global community of entrepreneurs, innovators, scientists, academics, practitioners of all walks of life, professionally and personally, who leverage technology to bring, hum to bring transformation into our work and society. Uh, we believe that tech and the infinitizing power of tech can truly help humans expand in directions and unprecedented directions. And today we are here with Andreas Forsland, who is the founder and CEO of Cognition, a company that truly epitomizes the trans technician, because it's a group of people that orchestrate so many different types of technology with one big goal, deeply transforming and affecting the lives of a hundred million people with challenges, different types of challenges around the world. Very, very welcome to Andreas Forsland. Today we're going to talk about Andreas' vision for societal transformation and how the universal design principle is integrated in the solutions, the products and the services that Andre, Andres and his company are bringing to fruition to, for people mm -hmm. to learn and for people to express and for people to be included in society and ultimately for their physical features to be augmented. The word to you, Andreas. Welcome. Tell us a few words about mm. your background. Mm. Thank you, Simeon. I appreciate that. Uh, welcome, everybody. And, um, well, you know, I'm in California here, so it's the morning for me. Uh, for many of you, it's the late evening uh, and any time in between. So thank you for taking the time with us today for this conversation. Um, <clears throat> my, you know, my background uh, is design. Uh, so I've uh, started my career uh, in the 90s, uh, working in digital technology, thinking about user interface design. Um, and so over the years, I've been exposed to lots of different aspects of um, human factors and how to design things for the internet and for small devices and TVs and set-top boxes. Um, and then later, I got into healthcare, uh, working at Philips Electronics. Uh, I was in their design group, uh, working across healthcare, consumer electronics and lighting. Uh, really thinking about what's next uh, around society and how different kinds of technologies could um, sort of start to integrate into the daily living uh, while starting to disappear into the ambient uh, environment. So uh, a lot of the things that we see around us today, uh, around the built environment and smart homes, uh, around more natural user interfaces regarding touch ID, you know, fingerprints and facial recognition, these are all things that um, I was exposed to about 10 years ago uh, in, in the early days of technology before there was really a market for it. <clears throat> um, but how I came to do what we're doing now, um, I started this company, Cognition. Uh, it was previously called a company called Smartstones uh, when we started uh, in 2014. Uh, and in 2017, we pivoted the company and called it Cognition. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about why. Um, but the real, um, the real genesis for why I created the company in the first place was a personal story um, that I'm sure some of you may be able to relate to. Uh, so my mother, uh, uh, well, as a young boy, I was raised, uh, I was an only child, uh, and I had, uh, my father was older, so uh, my dad was actually 74 when I was born. Um, so it was kind of an interesting uh, fact uh, of such an elderly father. Um, but Long story short, by the time I turned 14, he had developed early dementia and then it became into Alzheimer's. <clears throat> so at a young age, I, I, I learned pretty early what it was like to the stress uh, and, and the mental anxiety around um, caring for someone who has a mental disorder uh, and it's degrading uh, or it's uh, progressing. And so the understanding of cognitive abilities um, and how to adapt as a caregiver uh, around that, I, I sort of learned intrinsically as a, as a boy. Um, and then so as uh, in, in, in 2012, uh, fast forward to a more recent time, uh, my mom uh, was coming to visit with us in California. And when she 
turned 70 for her birthday. Uh, and when she arrived, she wasn't feeling well. Uh, and uh, it turned out that she had a very aggressive pneumonia. And so overnight, she was admitted into the ICU uh, with a very aggressive pneumonia, went into septic shock, uh, was going into kidney failure. Uh, and they put her on life support and she was in the ICU intensive care unit on a ventilator uh, for about seven weeks. Uh, so uh, she did survive, but it was a very long recovery process. And during that entire time of seven weeks, she was unable to speak because she was on a ventilator. Um, and so this was in 2012. Uh, and so if you think about what's happening all around the world now with coronavirus, uh, and the effects of how rapidly uh, it, it takes hold of individuals uh, with great surprise, uh, it's very difficult to respond uh, to that. And so what you're left with is um, my, my lived experience, you know, millions of people are living that experience today. Um, and so I have great uh, humility and empathy to share with you my story um, and also the kind of technology that we're creating um, that basically focuses on enabling people um, that are uh, in a physically uh, limited situation uh, to be able to communicate, uh, to communicate on their behalf when they are unable to communicate. And so that was inspired by my mom's uh, inability to communicate in the hospital because she had a ventilator. I see. So, um, wow. yeah, so that's, that's my personal story. Now I can, oh. I can go into great detail on lots of other things, but that was really the genesis. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you for sharing. And. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, when we first spoke about it, what I was really struck by was um, your idea of uh, building or transforming a society by starting uh, with solving the problem of niches of society. Now, a society that tends to massify and to uh, go for the big numbers first and then extend or may, maybe leave, leave some um, of those of the smaller niches are, are, are out and are out of the game, uh, you instead said, we need to focus on, on them first and then extend the know-how that we have developed and the technology we have developed to the entire society. I think that is beautiful. And I want you to spend a couple of minutes on this, if you could. Of course, yeah. Um... You know, I don't know how many people on the call are familiar with the, the idea of universal design, um, but it, it, it essentially the principles of it are by designing for the least of us, we benefit the most of us. Uh, and so oftentimes that means starting with a very unique use case that is very helpful um, to an individual. Uh, and then you look at how many other individuals share that kind of circumstance. Um, so <clears throat> for instance, uh, a curb cut, a curb cut in the sidewalk is considered universal design because it was originally designed for um, accessibility for people with wheelchairs. Well, guess what? Now that people with wheelchairs that can cross the road easily, so can people with a low, a low gait, so can people that shuffle their feet, so can small children, so can people with walkers, um, so can bicyclists, so can everybody, right? So by focusing on a unique need, the world benefits when you can adopt it universally. Um, and so same thing with motion sensors. Motion sensors were designed with a specific need and then they were adapted into automated front doors for stores. And now who wouldn't expect a store, the doors at a grocery store to say to automatically open um, or close. So these are expectations that people start to have around universal design. So for us, we really see the world um, a, a more just world uh, that is inclusive and that universal design approaches are what's going to help get us there um, by not trying to address the needs of billions of people all at once, but by focusing on a specific problem that can be solved, that if you understand kind of the ripple effects, if you can break that down into its most universal basic parts, that by solving that problem, you can see connecting the dots between all these other opportunities that benefit others, um, it becomes really gratifying because you can focus your attention on solving a problem very, very well and knowing that there could be potential adoption of that technology in other areas. Yeah. yeah. And Speak Pros seem to uh, integrate so many technologies and I'm just fascinated by having you tell us a bit more about the 
process of integration and the path to education, right? On uh, on, uh, on such a product that is a, such a like game changer in in the in the mm. field of impairments. Could you spend a, a little bit more uh, touching on it? Sure, sure. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, we're we're focused purely on solving right now. We're focused on solving the problem for people that cannot speak um, or have very difficult time speaking. Um, so just specifically, so we're talking about small numbers or big numbers. So by context, if you, if you add vision, hearing, and speech disabilities, if you combine those three, it's over 1 billion people worldwide. So roughly 20% of the world has vision, hearing, and speech disabilities. Of those three, over 500 million, so more than half of those are speech. Uh, and if you break down speech into its segments, uh, there's about a hundred different clinical pathologies that fall into that uh, speech disability. So <clears throat> when you think about the sheer variety, over 160 different unique needs, um, it requires a deep uh, framework, a philosophy for personalization. So how can you personalize the ability for all these different kinds of use cases to be able to access communication easily in a way that is humane to them and can respect them and whatever their needs are. So if they're, um, if they're highly literate uh, and they have a, they're quadriplegic, uh, you know, or they've had a spinal cord injury or a brain injury, that's very different than a 13-year-old with autism that's nonverbal, right? So you've got a wide spectrum of, of uh, sort of parameters that we have to design for. So I think what we've tried to do is understand cognitively and motorically, physically, all of these different um, uh, situations and started to look at what are those uh, shared values, what are shared values, what are shared experiences, and then what we've tried to do is build a technical framework that will allow us to, to, to make it possible for people to personalize their own experiences uh, so that they can access communication with less effort. So, uh, sometimes that may mean when you're saying we've integrated varieties of technologies, <clears throat> different people need to access um, an interface, basically. So if you think about Speak Pro, as you mentioned, which is an app that we have available uh, on uh, the Apple App Store, so it's an iOS today. Um, that app accommodates a variety of different access methods, right? So for someone who has um, Korea, so Korea is a is a disability that, that, that makes it very difficult. Like you, you, you might see people that are wiggling around in their wheelchair like this, or they have a very difficult time moving. Um, that's called Korea. So for individuals that have Korea, you, you need a specific way to offset that calibration so that they can touch a screen or they can control the screen. So we support um, what's called switch access, which is if they have a push button, they can push a button and they can scan the screen that, up and down and select things. Um, we support facial recognition and eye tracking within the device. So we actually can monitor their face and based on what they're looking at, they can click things by smiling or blinking. Um, so there's a variety of ways that we can make it possible within one application for somebody to access communication and personalize it for their needs. And that's really a big, big focus uh, around uh, this idea of how do you apply artificial intelligence or machine learning to an accessibility problem, right? And because and, it's very difficult to do just with um, toggles. <laughs> you can't just do it with toggles, right? You actually have to have some software running that is actually processing information and adapting to the person in real time. Um, during our previous talk, uh, you were um, telling us how the first beautiful integration you created in the platform of life, which is a, a concept I, I'd like to talk uh, with you again um, during this conversation, that to, to, to make this company truly understand and being empathetic with the issues that the company has to solve, you actually have people with impairments in your own organization. Uh, can you tell us about more about how that is uh, uh, easy, you know, to integrate in in a society that has uh, 
that's constantly driven by old style performance parameters and how is the flow in your company affected by integrating mm -hmm. you know by being the epitome of integration that's a, <laughs> um, i have to sigh for this one because it's um oftentimes there's a lot of lip service given to um what you say and what you do uh you know so there's a lot of corporate um, communication that comes out of big companies and small companies that sort of proselytize of what you should do, but you, they don't do it themselves. Uh, and in the history of my career, especially in developing products and design, um, you know, in design, you use all kinds of tools to try and understand the market and understand the user, right? So you have tools internally like personas and you try and figure out using research to simulate or synthesize a bunch of information to understand and build empathy internally uh, around who you're trying to solve problems for. Well, that's a layer of abstraction, which is interesting. But what's more interesting is if you could actually walk the talk and say, if you believe that the world should be inclusive, then you should start within your own organization, right? Um, and if you think you need to design for people that have a disability or if you have to design for anything other than yourself, then it should be correct to invite those people to design with you, right? So co-design with the end users and actually hiring uh, individuals to be a part of that process is paramount um, if you believe in what you're trying to do. And so I think there's an integrity piece that large companies need to, if they're going to serve a market, they should find a way to integrate that market into what they do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, how hard was it for you um, to bring the vision to fruition? You know, you seem to, again, sorry to touch on this again, but I'm particularly interested. There's so much integration needed, right, amongst the different technologies that you're working on. And especially in light of that, again, beautiful representation of uh, life that you have in mind when we spoke about life being a big platform right and imagining all the solutions being applications i find it fascinating but also very challenging and so how do you pull it off <laughs> uh you're right on both of those <laughs> um, um you know it's it's just around you know the operations of a business is around you know affecting affecting you know achieving a goal with the least amount of energy expended right and and so you know by doing so it forces you to think about the bigger picture and know that you're 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 concerning yourself with the world but synthesizing it into a scope that you can execute right and so by narrowly defining the scope that you can execute um then that's that's sort of how we're dealing with kind of the overwhelming nature of it. Um, uh, so, so as an example, uh, but I'm going to ramble here for a moment, but um, things are moving very, very quickly. Um, and when you think about the uh, a platform, right? So if you think about individuals with disabilities for a moment, um, oftentimes, technologies that have been designed for individuals with disabilities they've started out as mom and pop kind of things right like a family member that might be an engineer comes up with an idea and just wants to do it for their child uh, and then maybe a few more people buy that product but it becomes a cottage industry so there's lots and lots of i mean literally there's thousands of applications out there that do different things and so the, it's this interesting kind of kind of industry, but nobody's ever come or sort of had the audacity like we do to come in and say, you know what, there's probably a better way to make a bigger impact, you know? So today there's, like I said, there's 500 million people worldwide that have a speech disability, but only about 3% of those people, three, 3% of them have access to technology, right? So when we think about what we're solving, we're not just solving a technology problem, right? Uh, or a design problem. You're, we're trying to solve an access problem, you know? So how, how do you deal with distribution and how do you get more technology into the hands of more people? You know, so, so how do you have, make it affordable? Uh, you know, how do you make it easy and localized because they have their own language needs, um, maybe their own vernacular needs. 
Um, so by focusing on speech, um, and then we narrow it regionally, so right now we're focused on English uh, at the moment, um, because we're leveraging um, language systems. Um, and so language, you know, so we're trying to build natural language understanding and a semantic uh, understanding of what people are trying to communicate so that we can help them do it faster. So we've narrowed our initial scope to uh, English, but we do work with others to localize. Um, <clears throat> uh, and then, but this platform idea today, the distribution platform is broken for a lot of people. Um, and, and so if you need any kind of physical if you need any kind of physical supports or augmentation, um, you need to get that through insurance, uh, you know, or you need to get it through a, uh, a clinical evaluation, right? Uh, versus I just want to go and get it myself. I want to just download it out of an app store. Uh, and so I think we're going to see a tipping point when there's more stuff that is clinically endorsed, you know, clinically endorsed, but the regulations will allow for people to pick things up on their own sort of, you know, uh, and being able to pick up those devices out of the app stores or be able to pull them off of amazon.com and get a prime order. You know, when people can start to take control of accessing affordable things that are easy to get, uh, that are intuitive to set up, that's really where we're going to see a big tipping point. Um, and cognition is a small company focusing on this problem, but I think by aligning a vision, with partners, so like if Amazon wanted to uh, get involved and help accelerate transformation for people with disabilities, this is exactly the kind of thing that they could make a huge difference in. If Apple or Samsung wanted to get involved in making a huge difference, then taking technology like ours and making it prolific, making it available and accessible to everybody uh, would make a huge difference, right? Because there's, you know, through partnerships, you can reach the world. Otherwise, it's going to be a long, <laughs> it's a long transformation, you know. Um, so, you know, I think we, look, we looked at it, uh, uh, we looked at it really pragmatically and said, based on the business fundamentals of like uh, uh, an acquisition model, so the cost to acquire a single user and to support that user to come online and come on board under our own power, so dollar for dollar, like if, what would it cost for us to make a difference in 100 million lives? And, you know, it might cost us a billion dollars to change the lives of 100 million people. But then if we look at, you know, the billion dollars to spend to bring 100 million people onto the platform, imagine what the world looks like now where you have new ideas and new voices being expressed. You have people fulfilling themselves. You have artists, you have scientists, you have architects, you have people that can do things that they were otherwise marginalized and not just what they can do, but the network effect, right? So for any individual that has a disability, they have a family, they have friends, they have their first and second and third degree circles in their social graph that also benefit by that individual being empowered, right? And so I think there's this huge ripple effect that can happen um, by approaching the, the bigger problem in a first principles kind of way and figuring out how to cause that sort of pebble in the water, you know? Uh, we do, we're the pebble in the water, <laughs> um, but it takes partners to, to, to make those ripples go far, so. Thank you. It, it certainly, it is not a pebble in the water, but uh, the, the, the app that I would really like you to show us around a bit and perhaps show us the user interface or uh, if you have anything that can express uh, thoroughly what the app does and what the tech, how the technologies are uh, integrated and the user experience and uh, all the different surroundings, uh, conclusions around it, so to speak. Sure, absolutely. Um, I mean, would it be okay to share my screen? Yeah, absolutely. Great. Let's see. <clears throat> Um, so one of the things I also wanted to mention was that, um, you know, when you think about platforms that are globally accessible, you, you go to mobile, right? So mobile uh, hardware. Um, and so that's where we focused our attention. Um, but in the bigger, in the bigger plan, um, we believe that there's a better form factor. We believe there's a better, uh, a wearable form factor uh, that kind of would be the ultimate accessibility interface uh, and I'm, I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about that here um, but uh, so a little preamble on some of these slides so 
Um, <clears throat> you know, when you ask, you know, about our team, uh, we're, uh, our team's about 14 people. Uh, we're gonna be about 16 uh, in July. Uh, so we're growing. Um, but if you look at the composition of our team, uh, we're literally, we're 50-50 uh, female, male split. Um, we have uh, many languages and many cultures, even in such a small team that are represented. Uh, and we also have um, uh, individuals with autism, ALS, uh, uh, trauma, uh, spinal cord injury, and a stroke uh, who have uh, all, they all contribute to the work we're doing uh, on the design and human factors uh, aspects. Uh, we also have two individuals, uh, one with cerebral palsy and one who's uh, uh, quad quadriplegic due to a car accident who are both on our sales team. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so we, we really try and integrate and walk the talk uh, in the sense of including everybody's voice uh, in the work that we're doing um, and, and building a relatively flat organization. Um, we're headquartered, so I'm sitting in Santa Barbara, California, uh, and we're also based in Toronto, Ontario. Uh, so we have an R&D engineering team in Toronto, uh, and we have... Uh, uh, a s small satellite of uh, someone in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, as well as Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania. So, uh, you know, we we currently are operating mostly uh, through Zoom and and Teams and GoToMeeting and these things. Um, our Santa Barbara office has uh, come back together, so we've actually reintegrated our Santa Barbara team, but everyone else is working virtually. <clears throat> so our mission. So a lot of you might be able to connect the dots here, but Stephen Hawking is, is, is kind of an icon uh, and a, a very easy uh, person for us to point to, to represent the ideals of what we're trying to do. And if you look at someone like him, uh, you know, he could have very easily been marginalized and just uh, excluded uh, from society because of his not having access uh, to self-expression. Um, he was a lucky one because he had lots of really fantastic resources that circled around him to support him, but he's one of hundreds of millions of people. And so our goal is really how can we leverage um, technology uh, and smart ways of distribution so that we can get many more people like Stephen Hawking out there sharing their ideas. <clears throat> We're also working with a number of institutions, uh, primarily in Canada. Uh, but we're working with the University of Waterloo, the National Institute for Scientific Research, York University, Western, Ryerson. Uh, we're also working with the Healthy Brains, Healthy Lives. Uh, we have a strong uh, position with the International Neuroethics Society, uh, understanding the ethical use of biodata, biometrics, um, and how we handle uh, information that's personal, um, et cetera. So we also have a number of clinical relationships that range from speech therapy to behavioral therapy, ABA. Um, <clears throat> we've been written up uh, a number of times around uh, being on the top 20 list of most promising AI companies. Um, we're on CV Insight uh, is a popular uh, analyst uh, publication. They rated us as a 21, top 21 neurotech companies to watch. Um, uh, so uh, we're starting to, to raise visibility in, in what we're doing. Um, but really what we're trying to create, which are, cognition is really destined to become a restorative bionic interface for a billion people, right? That's our vision, is how can we create an interface that truly augments someone's ability and serves their needs uh, and, you know, uh, makes it possible for them to do what they otherwise couldn't. Uh, and then thinking about that social impact, you know, this is very important because everybody is connected to a large number of other people. So whether it's strangers, friends, teachers, parents, clinicians, caregivers, or doctors, um, the last one on the, the, the lower right, police, is one that's often overlooked. But if you think about, um, you might hear news in, uh, every once in a while of, say, a teenager with autism that might be eloped and um, had a bad uh, you know, a, a bad confrontation with the police because the police weren't trained on how to communicate or understand the behavioral uh, cues uh, that are given by someone with Asperger's or severe nonverbal autism. Uh, so you have, sometimes you have some pretty bad circumstances if you don't have access to communication. Uh, and what we're trying to do is address that, that root cause need. Um, when we look at the 100 million, uh, that is a subset of this, about 48% of those have strokes, uh, about 23% of those are traumatic brain injuries uh, that can either come from 
uh, physical, like physical trauma to the brain or other kinds of infections uh, that affect the brain. Uh, but it also includes ALS, Parkinson's, cerebral palsy, uh, MS, uh, Down syndrome, and cancer uh, and autism. So these are all areas that we've studied deeply um, and we understand a lot of how to design for human factors uh, for these individuals. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so if you look at the overall opportunity, we look at it as a spectrum. So individuals who are born with a disability, uh, all the way to individuals who have acquired a disability. So if you put these on a spectrum, um, there's a different time horizon around their cognitive and linguistic uh, abilities. Uh, so as they're starting to develop uh, uh, receptive and expressive language um, that happens developmentally at a young age and over their over their youth um, and oftentimes individuals who are young adults or seniors they have their uh, existing expressive language abilities and the cognitive abilities may be intact but something happens to their physical abilities that reduces their communicative skills um, so when we simply look at all of these different conditions we we boil them down into um, what's their intention and how do they get it out? How do they accomplish that intention? Um, so I try and reframe this idea of an IO. So in technical jargon, IO means input output, uh, which has to do with the user interface. We take one step further than that of understanding it from intention and outcome. So what is the intention you're trying to do and how, how can you achieve that outcome? And then how can we reduce the amount of time and energy expended uh, to achieve that. So that's the compression of time uh, and sort of the perception of time uh, as well as literal time uh, to being able to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. And the reason being, if you apply that to communication, if you've ever walked up to someone with a disability, sometimes it takes them a little while, it takes them a longer time for them to process what you're asking and to respond uh, in kind. And so oftentimes when you have a, a, a neurotypical uh, and someone with a disability communicating, there's a breakdown because there's an expectation around how quickly they can respond. And if they don't respond quickly enough, oftentimes that causes disengagement, where, you know, where they may uh, just disengage from the conversation or lose patience. And so for us, by focusing AI and an understanding of the human factors through this design lens, then it becomes really around how can we enable someone to respond more quickly and get to the words they want to say faster, maybe not grammatically correct, but they can express themselves faster so that they could have multiple iterations on a conversation. Because when you can, you can address that time envelope, uh, then you can actually start to move your way closer towards relationships. Um. Um, so that's really when we look at this and we say, well, what's your intention to speak or intention to move or intention to control something that's further away that you can't reach? And then physically, how do you do it? Do you do it with your finger if you can touch it? Um, do you do it with your toe? We actually have people who type on our keyboards with their toes. Um, uh, do you, can you use your neck? If you can't use your hand, can you use your neck and, and ambulatory ability? Uh, if you can't move your head very well or you don't have neck control, uh, can you use your eyes, right? And then you start to say, well, historically, the, the sense of last resort as a control interface has been eye tracking. Uh, you really couldn't, if, you, if, you, if you're not compatible with eye tracking, then you're really stuck. You can't, there's nothing else. Um, and so we're working on that, extending that ability through a direct brain interface where you can actually move beyond just eye tracking into um, a brain interface that can, essentially control and understand intention to drive uh, an interface. In how many, um, there's a number of types yeah. of, hmm? yeah, yeah, Th that's exactly where I was <laughs> headed to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In how many, how many uh, products do integrate this beautiful vision today? So that's where you are yeah. headed. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so, to, you know, in today's world, there's a number of solutions that are out there that do different things. So there's devices that focus on touch access. There's devices that use EM and muscle movement, there's devices that use medical grade eye tracking. Um, uh, and then there's, there's, there's EEG based solutions and also what's called ECOG, ECOG or implants. So you maybe heard of brain gate and other implantables um, that are um, being used um, as subcortical uh, uh, brain interfaces. Um, but these are very, very expensive, right? They're very, all of these solutions are extremely expensive uh, for someone to pay for out of pocket, which is why there's a strong reliance on medical and healthcare and insurance. So that's, that's today's situation and it's in the US and it's also every, pretty much everywhere else in the world. Uh, it's the same situation around how can I access it? How can I afford it? How can I get up and use it? Um, but today there is no, um, there is no uh, brain interface for communication. We're, we're literally the only one, we're, I wouldn't say we're the only ones, but we're the, the furthest along in, in developing a, a direct brain computer interface for communication. Um, uh, so when we think about making the world more accessible for everyone, uh, I mentioned this earlier statistically, about 20% of the world currently has a disability. But here's the thing, every one of us on this call, we're just temporarily abled. <laughs> we're temporarily given the blessing of having an able body. Um, and at some point in life, almost everybody will be augmented in some way. Right? We all will be augmented with some kind of prosthetic or some kind of sensory aid, um, whether that's eyeglasses, hearing aids, um, you know, cochlear implants, uh, contact lenses, um, you know, uh, pacemakers, things like this, in other kinds of implants, stints. So, so a lot of these things are all augmentations to extend our life and improve the quality of life while we have it. Um, so I think by focusing all of our attention and efforts and energy into designing for people with disabilities, you truly are designing for everyone because eventually we all may end up needing to use the tools that we're creating today. Um, accessing the platform, so there's things that, that people want to do and these are the areas we've been looking at. So you said, how do you deal with all of this? And so it's by prioritization. Uh, so people want to learn and grow, they want to communicate, they want to control things, and they want to access services. So we've intentionally narrowed our scope to communication. Um, and now we're starting to expand that from communication to communicating and controlling. So now you can communicate and control things with our interface. Um, so what we have today is a platform that basically can use multiple access methods and personalize them, whether it's a gesture interface, uh, gesture recognition or head motion, facial expressions, eye gaze. Um, EMG uh, muscle inputs, uh, EEG muscle in, or uh, brain inputs, um, and also proximity sensing. Um, and we're working on two form factors. So one is a mobile solution and the other is a wearable solution. Um, and all of them are, both of them are going to have uh, an AI assistant that's built in. So the AI assistant that's built in is going to aid in enrichment and fulfilling those other services to learn and grow, to control things, uh, and to access services. So our core has started with communication, but we're leveraging AI companionship to fulfill those other things that uh, individuals desire. Um, today, uh, we have an app that's in the App Store. It's called Speak Pros, um, and it's uh, it's a communication application. So essentially it's got a language system built into it uh, that makes it easier and faster to assemble uh, expressions. So you can assemble sentences through word prediction and being able to tap, very simply tap uh, certain words and, and play them aloud. Uh, and if you can't tap them, then you can use eye tracking uh, to guide the cursor around and blink or smile or dwell. Uh, on the different words to assemble them uh, as an interface. And you can see the woman on the right who is, she has CP, cerebral palsy, um, uh, and she's leaning way back in her wheelchair. So using a mounting bracket with an iPad, um, she can mount it so that it's comfortable uh, and she can essentially now communicate. And she's in her fifties and she's never spoken in her life. And now she's able to communicate with the people around her. <clears throat> um, so that's just one example of, of, of what we're doing. And I could actually give you a demo live or if you're interested or you know somebody who might be interested in this, I'd be happy to um, 
connect you or them with somebody on our team that can give you more information on this. But um, we also have clinical speech pathologists on staff. Um, so if we need to have someone um, provide uh, more insight uh, around uh, an evaluation, we can help with that uh, for, for matching for a particular patient. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, but what's even more exciting is because we've used the mobile uh, as a sandbox, um, so it's already prolific. Um, so devices are everywhere, so it helps us solve that distribution problem. Um, we're going to be, uh, early 2021, um, we're going to be making uh, a wearable uh, available. Um, that's a heads-up display uh, that includes augmented reality and a BCI. So it's a complete integrated system uh, that includes uh, the BCI electronics uh, using EEG as well as um, uh, the accessibility of using head gaze and other things for controlling the AR environment. So essentially it's one elegant solution that can accommodate a variety of access methods within a very simple form factor. Um, and so I'm gonna jump to, uh, so I have some, some videos of somebody, um, let me see, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna reduce this for a moment. So I'm not sure how the audio is going to work here. Uh, we can give it a shot. Um, but here's, I can show you an example of a video uh, of, um, let's see if it plays through. If these videos don't play well through Zoom, I'm happy to send you a link to them. Using this headset, has it been, has it been the first time that you've ever been able to communicate? Okay, has this made your life better? Okay, are you looking forward to using this some more? Okay, are you ready to remove the headset? No. <laughs> oh man, she's having too much fun. <laughs> so for the sake of time, I, I mean, I have loads and loads of videos of, of beta testers and other folks who are using our technology. Um, but it's just, it goes, if you, if you notice, uh, that was literally the first time she ever wore it. So we just put it on her head, we gave her some basic instructions and she was navigating within seconds. Um, so if you think about that time envelope around time to value, the speed at which somebody can experience the value proposition that you're trying to create, it's paramount that they have that epiphany, like, aha, this is how I do it, and that they feel like they're in control of their world as fast as possible. You don't get that kind of visceral expression of joy. Um, like we don't, I mean, we see a lot of joy with the, with the tablets but the joy that comes along with the magic of having a heads up display that you can use to communicate and still have eye contact with each other. You can make facial contact both ways. Um, it's, it's really powerful. Um, it's very emotional to see. Thank you for sharing. Before um, we open to the Q and A, I have one last question about regulation. Is regulation helping, supporting or hindering the process of bringing transformation into the world through your products? Um, regulation, uh, it's in, it's a double-edged sword, right? It, so it, it slows things down, uh, in order to maintain, uh, quality. Um, but when you have existing systems that are of, of the highest quality in the world, <laughs> you know, so by leveraging technology, so, so for the iPads, as an example, right? I mean, you're not going to get tablets that are any better than that. Uh, you know, so um, then it comes down to other things around use cases, around applications. So how do you clean them? Can they be sanitized? Can they be shared between users? Do they need to be dedicated to that user? So there's a lot of regulatory stuff that has to do with um, prescribing uh, a technology for an individual that insurance will pay for. Mm -hmm. The other thing is um, medical necessity. Uh, so there's a lot of... Um, time involved so so time is kind of our enemy on this <laughs> in the sense that there takes a lot of time and effort to get together in person for a clinician to work with a patient to present different technologies to them um, 
because they have to show multiple options and then based on which one that the patient prefers, then they then process that chosen one through insurance, which takes a long time. So it can literally take 120 days from getting the first evaluation to getting it in your hands and using it through insurance. Um, so for some people, 120 days, that's, that can be life or death. Um, you know, so uh, it's the time horizon related to regulation is what is the barrier, I think, um, more than anything else. Um, thank you, thank you. Um, opening to Don, I think some of you, uh, part of your question was already answered, but uh, Don Dulcinos, uh, he's in a trans tech community, is asking, does eye tracking or facial recognition happen through the app and capabilities of the phone or the iPad, or are there any external input devices, so e.g. switch or a BCI EEG headset? I think some of it is already uh, tackled, but... Uh, yeah, so um, the first question, Sorry about all the bings here. My phone is connected to my laptop. And even though I have my phone muted, I need to tell Apple, like, stop doing that. <laughs> when I put it, my phone on airplane mode, my laptop does not go into airplane mode. Um, so, uh, so, so is the eye tracking official recognition in the app or is it in the device? And it's in the app. So um, the app, we're able to do it because there's a depth sensor so there's an infrared camera that's projecting infrared light uh, on iPhone 10 or newer and iPad Pro or newer, uh, the, the uh, third gen. So those, those newer uh, iOS devices have an onboard camera for, for um, depth camera that uh, uses the infrared light. So we're able to use their Apple's hardware, but there is no existing Apple um, eye tracking facial recognition capabilities that do what we do um, and so we're pretty much at the software end of it um, thanks uh, uh, yeah. from Jackie how does digital accessibility guidelines such as WCAG contribute to design of speak pros what are the challenges in having insurance providers cover the cost for unprivileged patients with aphrasia um, might need to, those are two meaty, those are two meaty questions. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, the chat, so accessibility guidelines around how we've designed speak pros, um, uh, our, our guidelines, um, the, the challenge has been, uh, in who we've been designing it for. Uh, so, um, so for instance, it's not designed for people with low vision. Um, so there's a number of guidelines around vision. Uh, and accommodations there, um, voiceover support and things like that. But essentially what we've done is we've, we've employed as much uh, of the required uh, accessibility features as we can within the application, uh, within reason. Uh, so um, as a speech generating device, it's mainly about accommodating, um, say guided access so that you can lock the application um, for the specific user um, that we can deal, we can turn on and off voiceover. So if somebody is low vision, um, you can still navigate with that. It does support switch access. So if you want to use the native switch controls and configure that with a, a Bluetooth uh, a switch, uh, you can you can use that. Um, so hopefully I answered that question. Could you re could you re ask the second question? It had to do with insurance. That's a yeah. What are the challenges of in having insurance providers cover the cost? for unprivileged patients with aphasia? Aphasia is difficult. <laughs> I'm going to say that. Uh, aphasia is difficult to understand from a linguistic perspective. I think the, the insurance piece isn't the difficult part. Um, it's actually, there are very few companies that are solving aphasia very well um, because uh, essentially aphasia is really around understanding the scene that's around you. Um, we've been looking into aphasia. Um, it's, it's a challenge because typically if you, go, if you want to address aphasia, you really need to do, um, like mixed reality would be fantastic for aphasia because you can, do, um, you can do slam and you can sort of mesh the environment around you. And so you can build object recognition, um, which can aid in supporting someone who's aphasic. Um, so uh, for aphasia, you know what some of the words are, 
uh, but you don't, they, they don't come out. So an example might be you show someone a, a writing pen uh, and they might call it a, pen, a, a paper skate. And you're like, what's a paper skate? And it's like, oh, well, this thing's skating across the paper. You know, and it, it's like, how would you correlate and map pen to paper skate? And so there's, there's some very complex uh, uh, lexical structures that you would have to design for, um, for aphasia that's very different than other disabilities. Thank you. Uh, I think we have uh, a lot of questions and only six minutes left. If you're all agreeable, we can extend by, uh, you know, five or ten extra minutes to have all of them addressed. What, what about you, Andres? What do you think? Uh, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine with that. Um, yeah. I, I'm enjoying these conversations. All right, wonderful. So I'm from Slava. What speed of communication were you able to achieve for different types of cases in words per minute? Uh, it's extremely individualized. It, it, it really is. Um, so, you know, sort of the, the target, um, you know, the target for red language is around 150 words per minute, right? Um, so that's kind of the neurotypical target that we're trying to help people get towards. Um, but you, you may have an individual that has developmental disabilities where you know, they, may, they might take 30 seconds to get two words out. Yeah. And then you may have someone with ALS who formerly was a lawyer uh, and they're saying that the system is too slow, like it doesn't, it doesn't perform fast enough for them and they might be able to do you know, 200 words per minute using eye tracking with predictive text. Uh, and so there, there's a wide spectrum of um, perception and accommodations, I guess. Uh, and so um, I wish I could answer your question directly, but what we've found is that we've been looking at an order of magnitude greater than any incumbents that are in the market. So it's easier for us to say what's in the market today and what is sort of a baseline based on a certain user type uh, or a person in a situation. Um, and the existing systems that are out there today, most of them are called symbol systems, um, uh, which use uh, illustrations like stick figure drawings of different situations, uh, like flashcards. And there's usually a word associated with those flashcards. So people tend to, they're trained on understanding what these pictures mean, and they sort of assemble pictures into a string, and then they hit play. Uh, what we found is that we're, our current interface is roughly 10 times faster than that for certain user types. Um, and we can get more into that if you want to email me directly, I could tell you more. Wonderful. Uh, Jackie Lee again, uh, how does one assess if a patient has his or her language ability intact, for instance, among locked in patients? Um, typically it's, it's a progressive, so, so the way language, the way a locked in patient accesses language today predominantly is with a speech therapist that's working directly with them face to face uh, and they're using some kind of letter board. Uh, and so the, 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 the presumption is that they understand what a, what a letter is, uh, what is a letter and they understand a basic understanding of the alphabet. Uh, and so they're essentially conditioned to be spellers uh, is, is really common. So what a speech therapist will typically do is, is they, will, um, they will state every letter, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then they'll look for a physical um, indication that the user is responding to a certain letter, whether it's a physical movement, an eye, a, a slight glint in the eye. Um, and that's the first level of conscious awareness of understanding, like, are they in there? And are they responding consistently uh, to uh, the prompts to spell a letter? Um, usually it starts in a very primitive way with simply going, starting with yes and no. Uh, so the ability to go, you know, left, you know, like yes, no, yes, 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 no, right? And so it's, it starts in a very primitive way. And so what we're doing is with the AR environment, we're enabling them to put yes and no on the holographic screen so that they can access yes or no. Um, and that's usually the way to start uh, to understand dialogue and begin an assessment process. Uh, from Vimukti, do you test on cranial nerves and implants? We do not. Um, we, um, I mean, we, we, are, we have relationships with people who are doing implants and ECOGs. Uh, 
uh, but we're we're not doing any work in that area ourselves. Both Don and Jackie Lee are uh, congratulating on the design and the integration of BCI and uh, um, AR. Uh, how can we become better testers? Jeff E says. He's asking how people can become better testers. Oh, um, if if you'd like to, yes, uh, we actually have we're. we're sourcing right now. Um, we have uh, a beta program that we're, we're kicking off that we're going to be doing a number of tests uh, through the end of the year. Uh, so if you want to email me, you can email me directly. Uh, and Simeon, if you want to just send out yeah. my email uh, or of Allison, course. that's yeah. fine. Uh, Jackie, uh, if the user does not like the machine voice, can we calibrate the voice? Would it be helpful if a soon to be a phasic patient record their voice prior to an oral surgery or use of ventilator? Yeah, there's, uh, there's a technology, there's several answers to that. One answer is the last one. Can you record their voice before they lose it? And the answer is yes, it's called voice banking. Um, and there's a number of services out there that I can link you to if you're interested in that um, for voice banking. Um, and then the other one is if we needed to use a synthesized voice uh, that's not based on their voice uh, bank uh, voice, uh, there's a number of solutions out there. I think what voices are getting a lot better. Uh, you know, it used to be just <laughs> there was one robotic voice. And the funny thing with Stephen Hawking, as an example, um, he had he had people proposing all kinds of other voices that were much more elegant uh, and smooth and more humanistic. Uh, and he actually chose not to go with those voices because he had built a brand identity and his own personal identity was attached to this robotic voice. So he said, that's me. <laughs> All right. And so people just find, they just identify with a voice. Uh, inside of Speak Pros, um, we allow, we enable people to adjust. You can choose, um, today you can choose a boy, girl, man, or woman voice um, as a generic voice. They're, they're quite elegant and, and, and very nice voices, um, but you can adjust the timber pitch and speed so you can tune them up or tune them down within the application. Um, we're, we're using um, Amazon uh, poly voices. So if you want to look into Amazon, uh, uh, they have a very, very uh, good uh, voc uh, list of different kinds of voices that you can choose from. And they continue to deal with all kinds of um, native languages. And they're also dealing with some unusual um, you know, minority languages uh, in different countries. So you, you may you may take a look at uh, Polly, uh, P-O-L-L-Y, um, they're great. Wonderful. Uh, I have a question. Um, I remember you mentioning that your solutions, your products also work in, dis in disconnection from the internet. So... Disconnection, I'm sorry, from... Yeah, disconnected from the internet, from the from any networks. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is this is something that we find to to be very important. Is you know, uh, individuals they don't always have a perfect network connection. They don't, and ultimately, you for something to be successful, it needs to be completely wireless. Um, you should not have any uh, any kind of toggles or leash to a connection. Uh, so we've designed it from the ground up uh, to, to work offline. So we have an offline first paradigm where uh, you should be able to work without an internet connection. Um, and so uh, that means that the BCI and the AR and everything uh, is essentially independent. So if you're in a submarine or you're in outer space or you're just not anywhere near Wi-Fi, <laughs> I, you should be able to still not lose your voice. Uh, and that's, that's really paramount. Um, that also um, doubles with our ethics view of um, being able to have a, your personal your personal information is all local, right? So any PII is local, so that it's offline, so that there's no you know we do allow synchronization of some of your information uh, into your own private cloud, um, but it's disambiguated from your PII. So. Uh... This is about data ethics. So we yes. also discuss how this is important in a moment where biodata is very much rumored to be the next big wealth. 
uh, so I like your approach that you that is defensive of people's privacy after all. And and they're in control, and 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 if they choose to share it, then they can. But our default is that it's yours. Yeah. Uh, the last question I had is, what's the role of music in your products, in sound and music? As a, uh, yeah, music is interesting. Um, <laughs> there's, uh, ironically, so um, sound is very important. Uh, haptics are very important. So we believe that um, for a truly augmentative experience, it needs to include um, sensory stimulation right through your sensosomatic system and understanding through skin and haptics and sound um, so we're also considering the sort of spatial experience um, of what audio and vibrations um, can mean uh, both in the user interface to help enrich the interaction design um, but also to be able to provide you with cues of what's going on in the environment um, so these are areas that we're studying and we're designing into our solutions. Um, we're not explicitly um, dealing with music um, just because you have licensing issues. <laughs> There's all kinds of things that have to do with that, which are beyond what we have the capacity to deal with at the moment. So. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much for being here today. Uh, Andreas, thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoyed our conversation. And thank you, Alison. You've been instrumental in curating and making this happen. And what to say, if not, until soon. Ciao, everyone. Blessings. Ciao.